Thank you to our show sponsors, FMC Preschool, The Soil School, and Adama Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep today what you're looking for. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. And uh, after a week off for Family Day, it does feel like it has been a little while. And I'm super happy to be back here in the host seat. Uh, Tonight's episode of The Agronomist is also, uh, for any of you in Ontario, it is a knowledge sharing event. Uh, So that's a KSE for any of you uh, who had a successful off-calf project um, or have put in for an off-calf project that may be uh, yet to be approved. Uh, So welcome here. Just so you know, we will have uh, that link that you'll use to let OSCIA know that you took part in tonight's event uh, a little later in the show. So just make sure that you hang around for that. Uh, But thank you to everyone who's uh, already right uh, here on time. Yes, we are on time. Thank you, Ray Um, because somebody's going to say something about it. And uh, we've got some regular faces, of course, in the comments and uh, some some new names popping up that are starting to become familiar, which is really great, too. So uh, wonderful to see you all there. And I see uh, Kevin, who's Canadian cowman. He's out there in the Fraser Valley, has got spring management of cover crops all figured out. Manure in March, fertilizer in April, cut for silage in May. We should all be so lucky, Kevin. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, So, of course, for joining us tonight, if you do collect those CEU credits, uh, please head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist. Tomorrow we will have the show there. You can uh, let us know you took it in. Um, And Margaret May with OSCAA says the QR code will be shown at the end of the session and we'll, she will also post a link in the chat. Um, so we will make sure to get you connected um, should you be collecting those knowledge sharing event QR codes. All right. So yes, tonight's episode is on spring management of crop, of cover crops. And we'll talk about why we're specifically talking spring management. Uh, but to have this conversation, I've got with me tonight, Ryan Benjamins and Johanna Lindboom. Welcome here, Ryan and Johanna. Good evening. Thank you, Lindsay. Good to be with you. Yeah. All right. Well, Ryan, I'll start with you. Uh, what part of Ontario do you cover with with your uh, with your work? Consulting work. I do uh, mainly Lambton County. I get into West Middlesex a little bit, uh, but primarily Lambton County. For those that don't know the county structure very well in Ontario, close to Sarnia, you could. It's probably the largest city center. So. Okay. Um, and I get scolded for okay. assuming that places in Middlesex or Lambton County and vice versa. I'm not very good with counties, so I apologize in advance, everybody. All right, and Johanna, what area of the province are you in uh, and covering with Clark's Agri-Service? I cover mostly Haldeman Norfolk, so sharp sands, heavy clays, and normally get looped in with Niagara because all the clay wastelands get run together. Okay. (laughs) I feel like there's like a battle of the soil types that happens when agronomists get together and it's like no mine's the hardest to manage no mine is. <laughs> um, so yeah i do wonder although none of you i i'm assuming would have any experience with peat soils or do either of you have any of that in your region i think they call Very, them muck soils here but they're peat in manitoba there's a little bit if you get yeah. into wayne fleet um but like very small amount yeah okay and ryan you don't have any not so much, no. We get some higher organic matter, but I, I wouldn't classify it as peat yet. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. If uh, we've got some Manitoba friends that that deal with it, uh, Warren says clay just sucks. Warren, that's not the spirit we're going for tonight. Okay, so we are going to talk spring management. There's a few things um, that I want to cover for sure, but I want to sort of back up a little bit and first talk about some of the most common reasons why farmers are choosing cover crops or why you as an agronomist would be recommending them. Um, Trying to look at, you know, perhaps what some of the most common reasons are. So Johanna, maybe I'll start with you. What would you say would be sort of the most common goals for those who are using cover crops right now? I think big thing is soil health and prevent erosion. 
if you guys can pull up slide 10, we got a pretty good visual there. You'll take a second. There you go. Yeah, so on the right here is just a example of once we get oh into some of like the Brant clays that are on hills, we run into the erosion there. And I think that's originally what started a lot of the cover crop interest. But I think we've seen the payback in terms of how it's improving soil structure and soil health in general. And that's starting to pay back in us for yields. So let's just, as hideous as this is to look at, this, so the one on the right, what, do you have any field history on that? Like, do you know what would have been done on that field? It just, it's painful to look at. I got to tell you. It's so painful. Yeah. I didn't think that picture was real. <laughs> <laughs> it's real. Um, to be quite honest, I had one of our scouts send it to me this spring, okay. uh, yeah. wondering if this was a confirmation of what erosion looked like. Uh, so yes, I do not know is, too yeah. much field history. I'm guessing yeah. it was probably worked in the fall a little bit, but yeah, not pretty. That's not pretty. Uh, no. So, okay. So very much, and I'm, I'm sort of encouraged to hear the soil erosion one being near the top, um, for sure in that, um, we can talk a bit more about why, you know, in the off cap program, but in general, why we talk about keeping soil covered, um, well into the fall or those shoulder seasons. So yeah, really a stark, uh, example of the kind of erosion we could be up against. All right. So Ryan, similar for your area or would it change a bit as we move into uh, the Lambton County area? Yeah, very much the same. Um, we're, Lambton's often known for being kind of a flat or level, but we, <laughs> we still have hills. Um, reduced erosion is, is definitely number one, I'd say, uh, from the benefits of cover crops. Um, you know, nutrient cycling. Um, if I think of legumes specifically, I think of nitrogen credits for the following year. Um, as Johanna had mentioned, soil health. And uh, we, specifically when we talk about spring cover crops, that's where weed suppression is, uh, is a big one. So um, not terminating in the fall, leaving it till the spring, and especially a cereal rye cover crop uh, that's where we can really um, benefit from weed suppression. So, um, and then overall, just organic matter, trying to call it green manure, whatever you want to call it, but uh, it's it's a slow process. But anywhere we can add diversity with living crops, uh, it's a good thing. So. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you mentioned the nitrogen credit, and so you know, and and. Wheat Pete is still doing his dinner theater for another week. He'll be he'll be on the show next week, actually. Um, but this is where he would, of course, you know, interject with, you know, we've been doing cover crops for a long time because we've been using red clover on wheat, um, which, yes, is perhaps or at least, you know, as of five to 10 years ago would have been, you know, relatively common or at least well known. But um, we've certainly seen the evolution of not just mixes, but types. And you mentioned cereal rye. That's another really common one. Um, Johanna, for your area, is is putting red clover into wheat pretty common, or is that still kind of hit and miss? Absolutely. I'd say we're probably one of the more popular areas for it. There's actually some people that grow red clover for seed around here, and it's just on the clay. We really find that extra root growth and structure helps, and I really do like the nitrogen benefit for the corn as well. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan, how about with you? I, I'm, I'm told in Lambton, it's just soybeans on soybeans. So how could you ever fit <laughs> red clover in there? <laughs> yeah, well, and, and South Lambton's specifically bad for multi years of soybeans. And even then growing wheat, it's that's the greater challenge of adding a cover crop to those acres. You get the north half of Lambton, better rotation and seems to be the more cover crop use too. So we could grow the cover crop use in South Lambton. We'd really move the bar forward, but uh, cover red clover is still uh, probably one of the more common. I, maybe fifty percent. Uh, it's people usually go two courses. One, if you have manure and you want to get that manure out in the summer or early fall, typically then growers are picking a, a multi-species and having species like oats or tillage radish. Um, you know, that 
that use the nitrogen rather than fix it. Uh, they might go that route, but uh, if a grower doesn't have an or another organic end source, then usually it's uh, red clover is the number one choice. All right, now Scott, uh, Scott's got a question, and we are going to spend quite a bit of time tonight on uh, rye and some of the and the uses and and perhaps some of the cautions with using rye. Um, but so question here, can you elaborate on fall rye weed suppression when planted in the fall and what crop crop into spring and how terminated? So we are going to cover this, I think, from a few different angles. Uh, but maybe if we start um, this, we can start on this discussion right now. So planted in the fall, what kinds of results are you seeing uh, with weed suppression? I think you both have experience with uh, cereal rye or fall rye. Um, but Ryan, if you want to start, where is it being used um, specifically for weed suppression? Yeah, um, well, we can see weed suppression already happening quite early on in the development of the rye. So even on winter annuals, like specifically Canada res or uh, Canada fleabane, that's uh, glyphosate resistant. Uh, we can get pretty decent suppression out of out of cereal rye, uh, even when it's quite small. So the following spring, uh, it's not that we can totally let the the gas off completely in terms of controlling it, uh, but it's it's another mode of action we could call it. Um, mm -hmm even to the point where I have some dairy farmers growing uh, cereal rye, they'll chop it for forage. And maybe we just have to add some metribuzin uh, for residual for new germinated spring emerged fleabane, but we don't really have to do much in terms of burning down uh, fleabane at that point. So, and then you could go on with other weeds in the spring, then yeah, you get into uh, summer annual weed suppression as well. So your pig mm -hmm. weeds, uh, possibly water hemp, a little bit of suppression that way as well. Scott is blessed with being out out, out west, doesn't have to deal with half of those. Um, maybe most of those. <laughs> uh, but Johanna, and uh, again, we will we will sort of look into some establishment issues um, and some yield drag potentially. Um, but Johanna, what has been your experience with fall rye? Is it quite common where you are or still pretty new? I'd say it's still pretty new, but for people who are trying cover crops, it's a really good way to start. Um, and it's a pretty easy one to do. I saw Scott asked on termination timing. So that's one thing I think Jake Monroe found in his research, because he's got three or four years of data on that. The later you terminate it into that sort of planted green scenario, the better wheat suppression you're going to get. And kind of what Ryan was saying, we're going after a lot of the glyphosate resistant weeds with it because you're still expecting to burn down that rye with Roundup at some point. Um, but people have used it in terms of like a crimping scenario where if you're not wanting to use any herbicides, that could be a route that you go. And weed suppression plus that mulch does seem to do okay. Mm -hmm. um, and we do actually have a clip uh, of Jake Monroe's work that we will play in a couple of minutes, not quite yet. Um, Janet wants to know about seeding rates. So if weed control is your goal with fall rye, uh, is higher better? Is there a, obviously there's a, there's an economic question here, but what, how much is enough, I guess, is, uh, is the question to actually see some of those weed control benefits. Ryan, what yeah, do you I would, yeah, I don't think you have to go that high. Um, I think with some alleliopathic effect, you, yeah, you, as long as you have good, consistent ground cover, um, even 50 pounds and, and depends partly on the timing that you establish it, right? If you're establishing early 50 pounds is probably equivalent to like 150 pounds late. Right. So, um, just, just good, consistent ground cover. And if you got into spring and, and you were trying to say, get some good water hemp residual and we have to remember this, we use the term, um, suppression, right? It's not, yeah. it's not full control. Uh, the difference there suppression being some level of control, but, but not, you know, 80, 90% that we would expect with some herbicides. So, so this, 
you know, at the outset, so Kevin said, you know, manure in March, fertilize in April, take a cut in May. Are there, are there growers who are use like pushing cereal rye for feed or is it really, they take what they're going to get and not worry too much about feeding it? Or are there those that are pushing it as like a forage? Absolutely. That's, yes. Definitely yeah. pushing it as a forage. Yeah. Then we're putting more seed down. Uh, we're almost managing it a bit like winter wheat. Not, I don't know anyone using fungicides, um, but mm -hmm. certainly uh, a nitrogen sulfur application in the early, early spring to promote more biomass growth um, and, and trying to chase the tonnage. When you harvest it as a forage, you take a lot of the risk off the table. Like you're, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're not left with as many challenges planting into it once you've removed the above ground matter. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're yeah. not worried about too much growth if you're harvesting. Johanna, how forage. about, yeah, how about in your area? Is it very much treated like a forage? Um, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. But I think you did touch on something important there because uh, you really have to plan on what your goal of for that cover crop is when you seed it. Because typically something managed as a forage is going to get higher fertilizer rates and higher seeding rates than something that's just there for ground cover. And on the weed suppression side, I think I'm less concerned about like increasing the weight, the rate for weed suppression, as I am concerned about increasing the rate to an extent that it could potentially impede planting, especially if you have all of those plants up versus taking it off as a forage cut. Mm, okay. So you've hit on one of the things that I wanted to stress tonight was how important is it to have a spring plan for a cover crop? So, and I asked that question, there's some other really good ones that have come in as well, but I asked that question because I know that there are some farmers that, that chose to put in something like oats, something that, that nature is going to kill and terminate for them in the fall, um, that will kill over the winter and in the spring, probably don't have to worry about it. But we have oats that maybe didn't die this winter. We have areas that weren't very wintry for a lot of winter. So... Brian, I'll start with you, but same question to you, Johanna. How important is it to have a plan for the spring when you put a cover crop in in the summer or early fall? Yeah, it's it's extremely important. You you if you didn't have a plan, you could end up with really a mess. Uh, you you also need to be flexible with the weather conditions that you're given. Um, as it came through the comments uh, from Jason, he mentioned about, you know, in his area terminating one to two weeks before planting is key. Um, and even data to support that, uh, I won't ask you to pull it up, but I have it in some of my slides. It depends, right? Some data out there from Wisconsin, one site, or even in Ontario, I have one slide from Ontario, uh, one site year or one site can act differently right so depending on what rain events you get and what stage it is what how much growth you have um so you need to be a little bit flexible you but yeah you need to you need to have a plan um i would say terminating early is my number one choice uh early spring and then after that it's if you're going to terminate it late you need to follow up with the planter right away. Um, mm. You don't want a big crop to go brown and down on you. And then it, you get a big rain event and now it's it's wet and you've pushed your planting date even further. So um, yeah, that that is my preferred option is to control it fairly early in the spring. So Johanna, similar, like same question of how important that plan is and I guess as a follow-up, is it like, does it change farmers' minds sometimes as to what they're going to put in based on what their spring conditions are, are usually like? Absolutely. And I'd say the plan is critical and being able to change the plan is even more critical because oftentimes we do. And it's interesting because when I started scouting, we were sort of told never promise to scout someone's wheat before the end of March because that's when all of the weather happens and here we are. And I think I, we start scouting earlier and earlier every year, uh, whether we're getting less winter or we're just really excited to get out of the house, that could be it. 
But I think you want to be able to tell if those crops that were supposed to winter kill, if they actually winter killed sooner rather than later, um, so that you can kind of make a plan to get out there and you don't just assume that it's going to be fine, especially if you have a lot of acres to cover. And sort of to Ryan's point about termination timing, I usually like to think about either you know, crispy dead or crispy green in terms of what I want to plan into, because it's got to be something that you can cut through sort of that half dead ropey mess that gets tangled and wrapped up in everything is what we really want to avoid. Mm -hmm. All right. I like it. Crispy green. Sounds like almost Krispy Kremes, which maybe I just need to snack. Um, okay, we, we're going to, um, I am going to uh, throw to our sponsors for tonight's show. Um, and then I want to delve into a couple of the questions that have come in um, about some good questions on using glyphosate, as well as a couple of Red Clover questions that come have uh, come in. Uh, so it, if Jay, if you could go to our first sponsor clip. Our sponsors tonight are Adama Canada, The Soil School, and FMC Preschool. Weeds constantly evolve, but so can your integrated pest management strategies. Knowing the latest weed pressures, resistance trends, application techniques, management strategies, herbicide science, and more gives you the tools for a proactive, agronomically responsible response. Go to www.fmcpreschool.com for recorded webinars from field experts and curated articles. fmcpreschool.com, your knowledge, your business, your success. Just groove into the tunes. I apologize to everyone. For some reason, my mouth is not working today. Like brain, I, I don't know. The one week off or it's case of the Mondays, I don't know. Um, so... <laughs> I, I apologize. I'm going to try and get it together here. Okay. All right. So a few questions have come in and um, Kevin's got a good one here. With all this use of fall or cereal rye being terminated with glyphosate, how long until it becomes resistant? Um, which is, I think, a valid question. Um, when we are terminating some of these crops, are we still going usually just straight glyphosate or are we tank mixing? What do we see? Are we worried about resistance? Johanna, maybe I'll start with you on that one. So this is definitely one of those tough questions we talked about coming up, but um, the tank mix is really tricky because there's not a whole lot of tank mixes that are going to take that out. Um, a lot of the tank mixes that we're using are something that's going to kill a different weed, uh, whether it's a residual or killing something that glyphosate doesn't get, whether you're throwing in a group four, I think it's important that we kill it um, because there are some types of resistance that can be caused by using um, rates that don't effectively kill uh, a weed. So to make sure that you're using that full uh, two liter REL uh, to take it out, especially if it's like fully grown and in that boot stage. Um, and I think making sure it doesn't set seed if you can avoid it, right? So if you can prevent it from setting seed, that means anything that did survive is not going to um, be able to reproduce. But I think that's a really good question. Uh, if you look in terms of the plants that are most likely to develop resistance, which I don't know off the top of my head, but I think that would be a really good one to look into. And it's something we should be cautious with. Ryan, anything to add on that one? Um, yeah, I'd probably just echo really some of her thoughts now on red clover or fall termination that's easier i would say to add another mode of action um it's pretty common for people to use dicamba and glyphosate or um if it's not specifically red clover um glyphosate and 2,4-D in the fall um but in the spring yeah we it, actually maybe this is a good time to pull up uh mm -hmm. slide number two that i have on some spring cover crop watchouts. So you'll see my number one watch out actually is dicamba use. So um, mm -hmm. maybe I'll back up to, to cereal rye first. Um, the best way to kill that is with glyphosate. Uh, we can add some group one herbicides, but we'd have to use a pretty heavy rate um, at that time. And I think just a good dose of glyphosate is the best way. And as Johanna had mentioned, watching to make sure that we don't have any 
uh, going to seed, right? We want to kill that cereal rye. But the big watch out with dicamba in the spring, there, there's a watch out in two crops. Number one, in soybeans, we have to watch volatility, right? There's much more uh, dicamba volatility off green plant material than there is the soil. So if we have a cover crop, it's almost like, almost to the point, I, most of my recommendations, I actually pull the dicamba out in that situation. And I'll want to use more traditional, uh, like a saflufenacil, which is in Ontario labeled as like Integrity or um, Aragon, uh, and then adding Metribuse into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other one is the dicamba. We have to be careful that we can't use it uh, prior to planting in corn, right? It's just off label because we, we don't want that dicamba to get down to the root zone where the and the planter could possibly bring that dicamba down and cause injury to the corn. So in that situation, if we're looking at another mode of action, uh, it's usually for broadleaf weeds, it's uh, adding mesotrione, which is in many Callisto products, um, plus atrazine. That, that's another way to add a, another group, but uh, we're trying to stay away from dicamba use in the spring for those two reasons. One, it's off label, and two, we got to watch our volatility off green plant material. So, mm -hmm. and then the other one is uh, residual chemical interception. So, uh, it's something that maybe has some researchers scratching their head right now because they're like, okay, what should we do? Should we, if we want to lay down residual at that time and we have a growing cover crop, uh, that cover crop is going to intercept some of our residual chemistry, right? So, we're going to have lower soil concentration. However, the same researchers are finding that uh, the cover crop itself is suppressing weeds. So maybe we have 50% interception, but we have 50% uh, weed suppression and we're back to kind of level playing field as if the cover crop wasn't there. So, mm. so those yeah. are kind of my top two watch outs just with chemistry uh, and I'll leave yep. the moisture availability stuff for later another time. But yeah, well, that we could probably do a whole show on that. Uh, uh, Dr. Dave Hooker has entered the chat and he says herbicide resistance is much higher with annual ryegrass, which is a different species than cereal rye and is much more difficult to control. So um, this is one of my favorite and by favorite, I mean least favorite things about rye is that we say rye and it means six different things. So we do try to be as specific as possible. There is a beverage, um, there is fall rye, cereal rye, there's rye grass. We've got many different names, so we do need to be specific on these things. So uh, thank you, Dr. Hooker, for uh, jumping in on that one. Mark also says, I've had success with killing cereal rye with 1.5 parts of glyphosate when rye is pocket high. Okay, but Mark, whose pockets? Because my pockets are much lower than most people's pockets. So uh, I like that rule of thumb, but... I, yeah, if anybody needs an extra week, use somebody else's pockets. Okay, um, but but that's good. Janet shares crispy green, which Johanna is my new favorite term. Uh, term. Crispy green is around June 7th, but you mean uh, like you've sprayed it and it has started dry down and so now it's dead and drying, but is still green, right? Is what you mean by crispy green? No, I mean, I haven't sprayed it yet. It's green and it's going to Oh, snap. like, like. Yeah. Oh, like that big. Okay. Like you mean yeah. actual stock. Okay. All right. So then that makes sense for June 7th. All right. Um, okay. And Warren says, I love seeing Aragon in the tank with glyphosate really speeds up that crispy green effect. Um, mostly I just can't stop thinking about donuts. Okay. So I do actually, because there are some, uh, we're, we've got a question here on roller crimpers uh, in fall rye. Uh, so I am actually uh, producer Jay, if you could queue up, we're going to watch your, uh, this clip. Uh, with Jake Monroe with Omafra looking at some of the work that he's been doing uh, with fall rye or cereal rye and soybean planting. Cereal rye is a it's a really versatile cover crop. It's it's very winter hardy. Uh, it can it can you know overwinter well and then put on quite a bit of growth in the spring. Um, but really, we see that. The, the soil benefits and potentially some weed suppression benefits can come if you give it a good amount of time, typically in the month of May, to grow, you know, shoot up, put on lots of biomass, and, and we're looking at the system of basically planting soybeans into that standing rye and then evaluating 
all kinds of things after that, including yield. Mm. Now, last year you did a uh, a program uh, and you saw some interesting yields. I mean, it really did show that planting soybeans in the rye, even planting green, didn't really compromise the yield. Yeah, absolutely. So we had four site years in 2017 and 2018 and and a variety of different uh, soil types and situations and, and we basically saw that uh, planting green into, into standing rye overall on average doesn't hurt your soybean yield however a couple caveats there um, potentially if you're if you're not seeding at a very high rate you can you can potentially run into some stand issues having you know a sub 100,000 uh, soybean stands uh, in a couple of situations and you know especially if you're seeding later that's maybe just not going to be enough to cut it from a yield standpoint mm. talk about this trial now you've got different termination dates and planting green what are you seeing this spring Okay, so of course, you know, very challenging yeah. spring. Uh, you know, us here at the Laura Research Station, like everybody else, it just uh, it just kept raining, and and it wasn't until um, basically the middle of June that we were able to get in here and plant. Um, so early, you know, early observations, you know, standing here on the 11th of July, um, we're seeing that uh, that we probably planted a little bit on the early end. Mm -hmm. So so we're seeing that slot closure wasn't the best, and and actually, in particular. Um, on our on our rye that was that was terminated early so we had rye that was all seeded at the same date last fall we sprayed off um, strips uh, in mid-may and then we ended up with a bit of a, a bit of a residue a mulch um, and that uh, that strip there was the was the wettest we're seeing some open slots at this point the stand is good um, but we'll see if this dry weather persists and that may be an issue in the in the rye that we let grow the longest, planted into it, and then and then roller crimped it um, to kill it, we were seeing that um, we've got soybeans that are probably about a growth stage behind. They're shorter. That's all. That's all to be expected with this system. Um, uh, no surprises there. What we have seen, however, is that we've got we've certainly got uh, some issues with the comp with compromise stands in in that scenario and. Uh, We've been talking about that here at, at Farm Smart Expo, and, and we suspect that uh, we went a little bit on the early end when the soil was not quite uh, not quite fit, not quite ready um, for for the crimping and for the tractor to be on, on the ground. And yeah. so we're seeing we're seeing re reduced stands in the wheel tracks. All right, now that I think uh, was the soil school episode um, that worked. Johanna, maybe you can you're probably up to speed as well. I think there's been a subsequent year on that research um, as well that has pulled some of the data from that as well. Uh, but it does bring up the question of the roller crimper and it's sort of been mentioned before. And I have to say, like, it looks amazing to see what that field looks like after it's gone over. But it is a bit daunting to think that now a crop is going to grow through that. So I think both of you sent images and and some points about, you know, how you manage fall rye and so Ryan I think you mentioned and so maybe we'll start there with roller crimping that really it does set the crop back as far as the growth stage goes although I like Jake's point about whether or not it was fit to plant or should they have waited so that's always a good question um, but are you are we roller crimping in a scenario where weed suppression is the bigger of the goal um, of the goals here is that really why we're doing it or do we have other reasons for doing it that way yeah, I think the roller crimper, in my mind, is more for an organic grower that wants, you know, superior weed control moving forward. But uh, I don't see that being very common or growing practice locally anyways. Uh, as you mentioned, I had some pictures. So slide number five, if we start with that one, and then we can toggle through uh, as I kind of share this story. So this isn't done with a roller crimper, uh, but it's possibly what a roller crimper would look like. So this was planted, um, you know, flowering rye in June. And, and the planter was able to penetrate the ground. Um, and then the grower was concerned about just shading effect. So he pulled a roller through the field afterwards just to knock everything down. So it's not exactly like a roller crimper, but in a way it is because we, we sprayed it dead and to kill it rather than crimping it. And then it was rolled flat. So you don't really see much there. So if we go to the next slide, 
on the far end of the field, the grower didn't plant the whole thing. And so this was probably mid June and I was starting to panic because we had good soybean stand establishment on the right, on the left, there was some plants there. They were really small, but the stand was really uneven. This grower also plants in wider 20 inch rows. And I was quite concerned that there was some rows that planted just fine, especially if the planter was not planting on an old rye row. Um, so that's a, a challenge you can get when you seed the rye with a drill or an air seeder versus broadcast is that you have so much root and plant mass right concentrated in that row. If you're planter in the spring planting soybeans and you follow that exact row, it, that's usually where I see uh, more gaps in the stand than if it was broadcast. Um, this didn't end up actually being a disaster. We got a saving rain and uh, because that rye on the left, it had taken up so much moisture and then we got a rain and those beans came too. And at the end of the day, the, the yield was very close, like, like some research trials. So that's what I want to stress that not every site year or year, like every site or year is the same. Uh, and there are risks to doing this. So um, I think my next slide maybe gets into, um, that's kind of a close up. You can see there are some plants there and you start digging through all that rye material. You'll start to find some plants, but I was quite nervous at that time. And then my next slide um, is a picture of actually a success story in 2022. So this field was actually the highest reported soybean yield I had out of all my consulting clients. I won't contribute at all to the rye, but it's also a dairy farm that this field hadn't seen soybeans in uh, quite some time. Uh, it's not really high fertility, just medium at best. Um, but this is what I kind of liked. Uh, the grower terminated early May and then was quick. It was his first field to plant actually because that rye was starting to take some moisture out of the ground uh, where fields that didn't have the cover crop weren't really fit yet. They needed another five, six days. Um, it was broadcast rye, so you don't have that intense row where the plants are trying to, or the planter is trying to cut through all those roots. Um, and yeah, terminated fairly early. And I mean, at some point we have to ask ourselves, what was the purpose of the cover crop? And I usually, my good target with cover crops is always trying to make sure we have our 30% or more residue cover. Right, it's the same thing we try to target with tillage. We want 30% residue coverage. So here, uh, I know we accomplished that, uh, maybe a little more than 30%, but uh, not so much that it was uh, going to cause issues with stand establishment. We, this field was, I don't remember exactly, but it would have been a 80-90% stand of what was planted, which is pretty good for Lambton County in the best of conditions. So. Mm -hmm. That was a great photo. Um, and and some good points. And you've brought up the water use. And there's a few comments in the chat that refer to the water use as well. So we are going to come back to that. But Johanna, uh, you've also got a couple um, stories to tell with some images. Jay, if you could bring up slide seven of Johanna's. This one is also, Dave, if you like that one, you'll like this one even more. We don't see a lot of pumpkins on this show, I gotta tell ya. So this is uh, this is pretty cool to see pumpkins and squash uh, going into rye. So, so what is the story here? This looks really cool. So this wasn't actually roller crimped, but it was rolled. Uh, the grower didn't have a crimper. So sprayed off and then planted and then rolled. And did spray with residual herbicide. The idea of spraying the residual herbicide while the rye was still standing is to get as much as close to the ground as possible, which it seems to be easier to hit when it's standing up versus lying down. Um, but one of the huge aspects of having it rolled versus just sprayed off is to kind of per like get that mulch going on the ground so that when the pumpkins and the squash grow, they don't get a muddy side on the bottom. So it actually makes them a lot easier to pick. It makes it nicer for if you're doing pick your own pumpkins or something like that for people to come in. And I just thought that was a really neat idea. Uh, and we did see some really good weed control here. There was a little bit of ragweed escapes, but that was about it. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. And so this could potentially, for all of you jack-o'-lantern growers out there, um, so this is to help against like that muddy, flat, gross spot that you can get sometimes in the field. Um, super cool. I love it. Uh, all right. Now, you, there are, of course, and, and we are going to talk about the water thing uh, because that's pretty darn important. And we are also going to talk a bit about uh, nitrogen because that has come up as well. A couple discussions about and tie up or do you add more in after rye? Those sorts of things. Um, but Johanna, you do have a couple slides of less than stellar results. And I think it's important that we talk about why we have a plan, um, but also uh, that it doesn't always work out great. So I'm not sure if you want to go to slide six or s slide nine, Johanna, which one do you want to start with? Let's do six first. All right. So Jay, if you could go to slide six. Okay. So it, it, it's fine. No, I'm just going to go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it doesn't look that bad from a distance, but I think a lot of the easier cover crop stories are uh, going into soybeans versus going into corn. Corn is definitely a little bit of a tougher beast in that scenario. So in this case, we had winter triticale that was cut, uh, and then we had corn planted directly into it. You can kind of see in a couple of these pictures that the triticale, it has regrowth, right? So you end up with that competing with the corn in the early stages, and we try to spray it off as early as possible, but you still get this really spindly growth from the corn. and at the end of the day, I think it did all right, but it really struggled to reach maturity just in terms of getting that forage crop off, getting the corn planted, and then expecting that kind of moisture from the soil. I think you do get a little bit of, uh, like you take a lot of the biomass away, but you still have some competition for nitrogen because there is still residue there. Um, and then we did see a lot of insects in it. It was super dry, so we had a lot of thrips and I think some spider mites on those corn plants as well. The poor things they didn't stand a chance yeah like but me. that same that same year took the triticale off in a different field planted ip soybeans into it had fantastic results right. so i think the crop definitely plays a big factor here okay all right and uh, jay if you can go to slide nine so this was a really mm. interesting one it was uh the pictures don't fully show it but it was a cover crop winter overwintering cover crop termination trial uh with jake monroe and i believe he did one at tyler mcblain's and at matt bischlag's so this is heavy clay soil and we saw a huge difference in the termination timings of the cover crop so i think at the end of the day the fall terminated cover crop was over 40 bushels more corn than the latest terminated one um and one big thing you can see in this picture is there was almost a five leaf difference in stage across treatment, but it was sprayed a day and a half after planting. So you can kind of see um, on the far side there, like we had some radish that overwintered un unexpectedly. And, you know, we had all of the petals from it falling on the planter as we went along. And it was wow. really scary because I think when we were digging up a week after planting, all of the seeds were still in the row, still perfectly placed, but they had absolutely no moisture. So they all came up in a fairly even stand, but they came up over 10 days after the rest of the plants wow. did. And we had a crop that was at R2 and a crop that was just about to tassel at the same time. It was pretty wild to see the differences there. Mm -hmm. So, so this brings up a few things and and so let's focus on moisture um in ontario most years uh springs tend we don't tend to lack for moisture we usually um you know have good snow cover or we've had lots of fall rainfall we often start the year where we almost want it to maybe be a little drier than it is in say april and may so but at the same time as that example shows there's such thing as too much water coming out of the system if you can't get the crop in there. So Ryan, how, like, is the water question a, a concerning one for your area or has it worked out to the good versus the bad? Um, yeah, I would, I would say it's usually with corn, I would say that's the number one uh, where we run into issues with lack of moisture. Uh, part of the, 
part of it is to do with, um, yes, we can sometimes even close the slot uh, behind the planter, but then as it dries out again, that, that slot kind of cracks back open. And just the nature of corn, even if you had enough to germinate, uh, you still need those brace roots, secondary roots growing through that sidewall. Um, and if you've got that open up right down to the seed, that's going to be a big issue with corn. Um, soybeans being more of just a tap root growing down, uh, as long as you have enough moisture to get the crop germinated and emerged, uh, that, that small crop doesn't have a big moisture demand early, right? And then the summer rains get that crop really growing. So uh, there's a greater risk to lack of moisture entering into a corn crop than there is a soybean crop. So and that's kind of why I've been less excited about big, big rye going in the corn. So yeah, and and certainly so uh, Jason Vote out in Manitoba, you know, made the comment about letting the rye grow so huge that it's using up so much moisture. So in areas where moisture is far more limiting, that does become a, a huge concern potentially on, you know, if you're going to take it for forage or how long you're going to leave it um, as well. And Johanna, as, as your one example shows, um, when you've got tillage that's, how tall do you think that tillage was, that tillage radish? Like... I don't know, looked as tall as I am, so. I think it was pocket high. Yeah, <laughs> depends <laughs> whose pockets. We don't know whose pockets or which pockets. Shirt pockets, pants pockets, we don't know. Um, okay, we're very quickly, uh, I do want to, of course, send a last uh, thank you to our sponsors. And then Margaret, well, uh, Jay is playing that. Margaret, if you will, if you're on there, if you will share the link uh, in the chat, we'll also, after this sponsor read, we'll get that link up there for those who are um using this event as a knowledge sharing event. So Jay, our sponsor read, if you will. Our sponsors tonight are Adama Canada, FMC Preschool and The Soil School. Soil health directly impacts crop health, which directly impacts your bottom line. Real Agriculture Soil School provides an opportunity for farmers to learn how to improve soil through discussions on the use of cover crops, strip till, no-till, compost, manure, and more. The Soil School is made possible by support from the Mosaic Company. Find out more at realagriculture.com slash soil dash school. All right. So, Margaret, if you will, um, share the link and we'll put it up on the screen if we can. Um, and for anyone who, we're going to try this. If it works, great. If it does not, um, yeah, we need the link though, Margaret. Um, so we'll just wait for that to show up. Uh, Gord says, Gord Spec Snyder says, small amount, of, so for example, 10 pounds of cereal rye in the cover crop mix after winter wheat, plant corn, then terminate cereal rye shortly after. Good idea, bad idea. Oh my goodness, Gord, could we start a new segment on the show called Good Idea, Bad Idea? Uh, <laughs> okay, Joanna, maybe I'll start with you. Good idea to put a bit of cereal rye uh, after winter wheat, put the corn in, then terminate? Good idea, bad idea. Uh, I think it depends on if it's a wet or a dry year. So ah. if it's going to be a wet year, I would say terminate after. If it's looking like it's going to be dry, I would say terminate early because we know that's going to suck up the soil moisture. And kind of what we saw on my slide, that was one and a half days difference of crop uptake moisture led to basically a week's worth of delayed maturity. So I think wow. you kind of see what the weather's doing and kind of judge from there. Ryan, good idea, bad idea. Uh, I don't think that's a good or a bad idea. Like I, I'm not really concerned about 10 pounds being too much or too little. Um, I would say depends on your other challenges you're facing, like especially in terms of weed control. So in the fall, if you've got a lot of volunteer wheat, and especially if it's in a windrow, if you baled the straw and you've got this thick mat of volunteer wheat, or you've got, you know, dandelions, thistles, that sort of stuff you want to terminate in the fall, um, I would be more inclined to look at what your other weed control issues are 
Uh, but I don't think 10 pounds would, would cause you that in itself will not cause you much grief. So I, I think it, that I guess is a good idea. So, okay. So on to the, on the question of, um, hang on just one second. I'm just wondering if we've got the link here. Um, okay. So on the question of nitrogen, so we've certainly, I think had, hit on some of the differences between managing uh, any cover crop, either early spring or just at a head of soybeans and a head of corn is very different. So we do have to think about, you know, what is the following crop and what some of those concerns might be. Um, there's a couple of really good comments. So Mark uh, comments on thinking about the carbon to nitrogen ratio of as the cereal rye progresses in maturity, the carbon to nitrogen ratio changes, right? As it becomes crispy green, as we call it, with that all that extra lignin laid down to stand up tall and strong. Um, so we've got, you know, that different carbon to nitrogen ratio. So are you in your planning, um, especially, I guess, in the in the case of corn, following any sort of uh, cover crop or sewer rye, especially, are you adjusting your nitrogen rates up if there is cereal rye in rotation or either of you or have you um i'm looking more at adjusting up the amount of nitrogen to the the cereal rye itself as a forage crop mm, um just so that we're not kind of depleting that soil reserve entirely uh prior to the corn getting established um and then the other one is we can maybe overcome some of that c to n ratio uh, especially with planter banding of nitrogen uh, for the corn. So uh, whether it be even 28% um, dribbled surface applied or two by two uh, on the planter, though having enough, I would say probably at least 60 pounds of N, something like that, or maybe at least 50 to get it started um, enough, more upfront N to get it to side dress timing. So, Okay. Johanna, how are you tackling the end question? I completely agree with Ryan. I think unless it's getting taken off as a forage, my goal after previous experience is not to let it get that big ahead of a corn crop versus ahead of a soybean crop. We might see a little bit of that lag when it comes to nodulation. Um, but one of the big components is that placement of the nitrogen, like Ryan was saying. And I think something that's come up with people that are doing cover crops or reduced tillage or a combination of both is that you can't put glyphosate, nitrogen, or specifically 28 and uh, your herbicide in the same tank mix pass and have it be effective. So you have to look at either breaking out that burn down or finding a different way to get nitrogen to the crop. And especially on heavy clay soils, we've seen a big benefit to having it placed closer to the seed and having more pounds up front. So kind of in that 50, 60 range, like Ryan was talking about, I think that's a great way to kind of get around that problem. And then you can have your glyphosate and your residual in the same pass. Mm -hmm. um, certainly it does. So, and this is one of the questions that has come up with bringing more cover crops into rotation is if if you aren't terminating in the fall um and there are reasons not to and and for you know off calf funding you you can't you have to leave it to overwinter um that it does it is one more thing to have to deal with in the spring and so johanna to your point it does you do have to have a plan but also i mean there are different things to think about you have other field passes you need to be doing as well and you can't necessarily roll everything into the same pass. So um, Dr. Dave Hooker wants to know thoughts uh, from Ryan and Johanna of strip chilling into a cover to reduce the allelopathic and immobilization in the crop row for corn. Anyone have any thoughts on if or if you know anyone doing this or have seen this? So um, if we go back. Oh, go ahead. Go oh. ahead, jo Johanna. I was going to say, if you go back to that slide nine, that was strip tilt um, to give Dave a thought. And I really love the idea of strip tilling into it. But I I think part of it, too, you look at the alleliopathic effect. Uh, something else that it's being looked at is the light interception. And 
I think even in the case of that triticale too, I think we have reduced light interception if you have a really big cover. And like one thing you can kind of see with the zoomed in corn plant in the middle there is it definitely is more spindly. And I don't know if it's getting shaded out for sure, but that is something that I think is worth looking into. Um, Brian, before you hop in here, Warren Schneckerberger says that he's lost as much as 45 bushels per acre stripping and not getting the rye terminated on time. So is the rye termination timing the more important regardless? Maybe. I don't know. Um, Ryan, have you seen strip tillage in that sense? Um I would say maybe try it on a small scale. Um, I used to be inclined when people grew rye, especially for forage. And if they chop it, there's sometimes very little moisture there. And just simply getting the planter in the ground is a challenge, right? It can, you, mm -hmm. you need a lot of downforce or we added weight to the planter. And I used to say, tell growers, oh, don't touch it. Don't like, really don't touch it. You're going to dry it out even more. And I don't know, it seems like with some of the tillage tools that are available today that we can run it more level and shallow. Um, I, I'm less scared of a tillage pass, drying it out even more. And I think getting the, the seed at the right depth, say corn at two inches, is more important uh, and getting that consistent emergence. Um, so I've kind of changed my tune a little bit on, on tillage uh, with rye and, uh, I wouldn't be scared to necessarily try it. Um, I, I also want to share, there is some research going on like Olivia Nuremberg, I believe she's with pride seeds in Ontario. Um, she did her master's on this with Francois Tardif from the university of Guelph and looked at a bunch of different things, but, uh, twin row planting the rye versus solid seeding the rye. And when you twin row it, then you leave, say, two seven and a half inch row spacings to plant your crop into. Um, but it's my understanding that data didn't really show statistically different uh, those two treatments. So, um, yeah, even the solid seeded rye looked pretty good in those trials. So. Um, I did have a slide on that, but I'm not going to ask you because I imagine all there's there's a lot of numbers on one page and it would just be pretty small on the screen for a lot of folks. So but. I can put a plug if people want to see that slide, they can tune in and watch the Ontario Ag Conference, which is going to be available for another month. Good plug, Johanna. There you go. Um, <laughs> Pete will be super proud. He really will. <laughs> One more month to watch it. Uh, no, that's uh, now I do wonder what years. So it was for a master's project. I, as you, I mean, as we've talked about, depending on the year, you can get very different results, which is why we like to do things year over year, multi locations and add up our experiences. But um, I, I suppose it does depend if it was a two year project um, and the weather worked really well then we may not see any of those those statistical differences. Again, I'm having trouble with it today. Um, all right, so yeah, so as I was saying, um, Dr. Dave, I think if she had a few more locations of the twin were awry, then the corn yield difference would, would be a stat higher than solid seeded. So yeah, so this is one of the things I, so this is my plug then for somebody to pick up where she left off and maybe add a couple of years and we'll see if there is a difference. And uh, if we can see it and, or maybe there isn't, and then that's our answer. Um, but yes, for sure. All right. So uh, I didn't, Margaret, I don't know if you tried to share any sort of link. Oh, will there be a link? I don't see a link. Um, so for anyone um, who doesn't have Margaret May's direct email, uh, you are more than welcome to email me, lsmith at realagriculture.com. Um, and uh, we will get you connected uh, for that. There we go. L Smith at realagriculture.com. Zip me an email. Um, I believe though, so Margaret did say to head to the, there's a form at the, on the OSCIA website. I think you need the date and the title. Um, so just let us know and we will help you out. And uh, yeah, anyone who needs to, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. And Johanna, 
the oh good okay yes that was the one i wanted to cover thank you there is a question about red clover that was way back at the beginning that brendan i think put in the chat um thank you i almost put that but i wanted to go back to it all right so and it, it's a question about there we go consistency of establishment with red clover i think i have learned that um, there are certain people in this world who have excellent luck um, and other people that are cursed with red clover. So Brendan says it seems to work okay for us on wheat after dry beans, which is worked ground, but have given up on wheat after no-till soybeans and they plant oats there instead. Johanna, what thoughts do you have on that one? I think as far as getting the red clover established, a few of the big things that have helped is seeding at a higher rate. Um, but one of the things I would also say is when is a cover crop ever really even? I think a lot of the times, if we're seeing spatial variability within a field, you're going to see spatial variability within your catch. And one really neat thing that uh, there's been a project going on between grain farmers of Ontario and Veritas or Devron over the last few years about looking at some of that variability in red clover catches and assessing uh, nitrogen credits and in in-season application scripts to it. And I think they've just about wrapped up the project. So I was going to suggest that anyone who's interested in that kind of information to talk to Jordan Sinclair with Veritas and Devron, because I think she's just about finished it up. And I think that's really exciting because a lot of times we don't get a consistent stand, but we want to keep it and we want to give some nitrogen credit to those areas. And it's just a matter of assessing it. And I think we have the tools to do that now. Okay. Um, Scott here is saying, trying links in the chat and their YouTube blocks them. That does happen as I, it has happened before Scott. So thanks for that. Um, Facebook, I think we can, um, but either way, uh, if anyone is looking for their KSE, uh, just zip me an email and I'll get you connected. Um, yeah. And this, oh my goodness, <laughs> Warren, <laughs> Warren also on the comment of terminating rye, uh, kill it with fire yesterday. So there you go. Also, apparently we didn't have Facebook running tonight. Okay, so tonight is just one of those nights. Still good numbers, so that's okay. Um, all right. Uh, so we are out of time, which it has absolutely flown by. Um, and so I appreciate it so much. Some fantastic questions uh, from the audience as usual. Um, really, really appreciate all the questions and comments rolling in uh, that help sort of guide the conversation. A big thank you, of course, to our show sponsors tonight. So the Soil School, Adama Canada, F and FMC Preschool. Preschool. I told you, like, oh my gosh. All right. Um, and of course, thank you, Ryan, for joining me tonight. You're welcome. Yes, and thanks, Johanna, for joining us on the show again. And look, no one even asked you the world's hardest question. I thought Francois was going to hop on and ask you something really tough. I'm really thank glad you. he wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Francois. Um, all right. Thank you both so much. And, uh, of course, everyone head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow. Let us know you took in the program, and we'll get you those CEU credits as well. Next week, as promised, so Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson uh, is on the show. Bern Tobin's going to take over the host seat. Um, and Dennis Pennington is going to be here, and we are going to talk about the Great Lakes Yen Project. So it will be all wheat all the time next week. 8 p.m. Eastern next week. Check it out. Um, all right. Have a great evening, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>